may I request Mini or Harshad to type the link in the message window so that everyone can see? Uh, okay, so just to answer that question, I guess on the top left of the screen, uh, there is a cursor that appears which says live on YouTube. Interested uh, participants can click on that and then accordingly check it out. All right, so, you know, thank you all. Uh, uh, a very, uh, you know, warm welcome to your alma mater. Uh, I'm sure your talk is going to be lovely. So uh, please take a pro. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Anandia. Uh, so it's great to be back at time, uh, Ahmedabad, so though it's uh, virtually. Uh, so uh, let me uh, quickly pull up the PowerPoint so we can start the presentation from there. Yeah. So I hope the PowerPoint is visible. Right. Uh, anyway, let me pull up the chat this one. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, like uh, Anandya mentioned, the topic of uh, today's discussion is, you know, effects of pharmaceutical price regulation, uh, evidence from India. Uh, so we've been working on this paper for uh, quite some time now, for about uh, three to four years now. And, uh, you know, uh, myself, Professor Pradeep K. Chintabunta from uh, Chicago, uh, University of Chicago Booth School of Business and uh, Professor Armin Sahai, so who's also here uh, on the uh, seminar uh, from I'm Ahmedabad. So we've been working on this for quite some time. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it is shaped up to be a really, uh, you know, interesting work and we found a uh, you know, lot of interesting insights uh, uh, based on the research work that we've done. Uh, so let me take you over a brief overview of, you know, uh, what we have done, uh, what is the research objective before jumping into, you know, actual presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please do type it on the chat and, uh, you know, somewhere, uh, you know, along the line, so I can uh, take a stop after 15 to 20 minute mark and I can uh, address some of the questions. Uh, but after the presentation is done in then about 40 to 45 minutes, uh, we can have an open floor and we can have a discussion. Uh, and if you have any questions, so you can feel, feel free to raise. Uh, right. So the research objective uh, is basically, you know, uh, the government of India came up with a national list of essential medicines. Uh, so somewhere in 2011, so they started the process and they came up with uh, 348 drugs that they uh, call them as essential medicines that are, uh, that are you know, that address the priority health needs of the country. Uh, this was in back in September 2011, uh, but in 2013, the government of India, uh, through the Department of Pharmaceuticals, uh, they came up with this drug price control order, which is DPCO, and they brought all these drugs that were considered essential under certain uh, some form of price control. We'll talk about the price control mechanisms, everything uh, as we go along, but uh, this is the context in which we've done the research work. Uh, of course, the objective of this particular price control order was to make sure that uh, these essential medicines are uh, you know available and affordable to the poorer masses. And so that was explicitly stated as the objective of the price control order. What we are doing in this research work is empirically examining the effect of this particular price control order on sales volumes. Have the sales volumes gone up or gone down for these regulated molecules? And we are also examining the changes in prescription behaviors of uh, you know, a group of doctors we term as non-MBBS doctors. Uh, these are the doctors without formal allopathic medical degrees, and they still prescribe allopathic uh, medicines. So, and uh, they basically serve the disadvantaged, uh, majority of them serve the disadvantaged in the country. And we wanted to figure out whether their prescription behaviors have changed because of this particular price control order. Because of course, objective of the price control order was to serve the masses, right? So with that research objective, uh, so I'll just give you a <coughs> sorry, brief overview of uh, how we've actually organized this presentation. So we'll talk about the literature uh, very brief about what the literature says about price regulations in the pharma sector. Uh, then we'll jump into Indian pharmaceutical uh, market and price regulations. Uh, what were the prior price regulations in the country? Uh, then we'll talk about the mechanics of uh, DPCO 2013. Uh, for, after that, we'll start an empirical section where I'll explain uh, briefly explain the data that we used to analyze uh, and uh, the empirical strategy. What is the key identification strategy that we used and what were our results? And then we also provide some evidence for the mechanism, uh, mechanism of why we expect why we find those results. Finally, we'll move on to conclusions and further steps. So this is a basic overview of you know, uh, what we have in mind. So if you look at the prior research, uh, extent research in marketing domain, especially on you know, uh, uh, price regulation in the pharma sector is focused on developed nations, uh, mostly where in the US where prices are mostly unregulated. Uh, so there's a lot of work in that domain, uh, how pharmaceutical uh, prices have an impact on prescription behaviors and that stuff. Uh, in Europe, prices are controlled using different mechanisms, either directly or through reimbursements, some sort of margin controls. So in Spain and UK, for instance. So most of the research work has been 
on uh, in focused on these contexts uh, further looking at uh, you know public policy side of things so regulations uh, you know prior research also has shown that regulation can have an impact on drug launches uh, it can also have a uh, you know some sort of a deteriorating effect on innovation in the pharmaceutical sector and r and d investments were also found to be affected because of price regulations because of uh, firms anticipating decline in margins but what we find uh, interestingly is you know there's a lot of uh, there's no uh, systematic empirical evidence on how this uh, price regulation is affect, affecting emerging economies and uh, especially the sales volumes even in uh, uh, developed nations we don't really have a lot of research on you know sales volumes and prescription behaviors because of uh, price, uh, pharmaceutical price regulation that has been introduced so that's the context in which we are actually uh, uh, you know doing our research why is it important uh, in india uh, and which is a characteristic of uh, other emerging economies as well there's a lack of universal health uh, insurance or healthcare systems right and we are a completely privatized health economy with uh, almost 80% of health uh, healthcare expenses are coming out of pocket right and uh, hence the reason for price regulation is kind of you know making the drugs uh, affordable and accessible so it's very essential that we understand the impact of this particular price regulation to uh, understand the positive as well as the negative effects of this price regulation that's why uh, that's a motivation behind this particular research work right so moving on to the indian pharmaceutical market i won't be going through a lot of stats about the uh, ipm but um, just a brief overview uh, most uh, as you all know it's a, you know we are a branded generics market 95% of uh, sales in india is actually off patent uh, molecules or generic drugs uh, and specific brands are being marketed by pharma firms for instance uh, for the chemical atorvastatin which is basically prescribed for cholesterol issues statar is a brand right so statar is basically atorvastatin that is a branded uh, generic so Uh, prior to DPC war 2013, there have been four uh, DPC wars in the past in the in our country. First one was in uh, 1970, where you know uh, there was some sort of a restriction on uh, pre-tax profits. Uh, so, so diversity, well diversified firms uh, really I know shifted their focus to other categories, you know, over-the-counter drugs because the margins were actually declining in uh, in in the regulated uh, sector. Uh, but other firms, the smaller firms, which are not operating in uh, mass market segments, they kind of found it difficult to transition, and they kind of exited the entire market. So there was a lot of issues on the supply side in 1970. In 1979, uh, instead of restricting the pre-tax profits, uh, government actually introduced, uh, you know, uh, a list of 370 drugs and uh, you know uh, brought these prices under control, price of these drugs under control. But several uh, firms discontinued those uh, production of those regulated drugs because of because the declining margins. So uh, and then you know focus shifted to other factors such as brand image and reputation rather than you know uh, competing on price. Uh, further, there was another uh, you know DPC one 1987 where they saw the negative effects of uh, prior regulation and they brought down the number of drugs to 142. And further, it was brought down even further to 74 in 1995. Only 74 drugs were under regulation. And uh, around 2011, when we you know, looked at the, all these regulated molecules, 27 were no longer under production. So uh, majority of the market is under was unregulated at the at that point in time, right? Anyway, uh, so this is actually the effect of uh, you know uh, on profit margins due to different uh, price control orders in the past. So you can see that you know every order has had a uh, negative impact on uh, profit margins. Only in DPC would pour when the number of molecules were actually reduced drastically, the profit margins started picking up uh, again. So there's been always a negative impact on uh, uh, on the pharmaceutical sector. So due to price uh, control regulations in the past. Right. Uh, coming to context and focus, so we, uh, which is DPC for 2013, drug price control order 2013. Uh, like I mentioned, so uh, the uh, national list of essential medicines, where uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, there was a national consultation meet that was set up, uh, and uh, they came up with the criteria for in, uh, identifying medicines uh, to be included in this particular essential list. And the final list consisted of about 348 drugs across the therapeutic uh, classes, and these were considered essential and life-saving. And those that address the priority health needs, they use different criteria. Different uh, uh, experts use different criteria to come up with this final uh, final list of uh, molecules. Right. Uh, so here we're referring to molecule. Uh, by molecule, we are referring to the chemical name. Uh, for instance, like I mentioned, atorvastatin is a molecule. We'll refer that to as a chemical name. Brand is a particular molecule. Uh, you know that's marketed by a firm. So that's a branded molecule marketed by a firm. For instance, Statar is a uh, uh, is a brand name of atorvastatin marketed by Dr. Reddy's. Uh, we also have another term which is formulation where two or three molecules are combined but for simplicity we'll just refer to formulation and molecules as you know molecules uh, so there are no confusion for this we can use a uh, single terminology in this uh, presentation so uh, so how these uh, how the uh, price regulation worked was you know all these uh, molecules the entire uh, 
uh, list of 340 uh, 40 molecules were brought under price regulation in 2013, there was a price ceiling that was set. Uh, so for instance, for each molecule, there are several brands. So uh, Government of India took the prices of each of these brands uh, that had at least 1% market share, took a simple average of all of them, and then uh, said that that is a cap, uh, you know, a cap price cap for that particular molecule. So brands that were priced above the average, they were uh, expected to reduce the prices, but brands that were already priced below, the interesting part was those that were below, they were not allowed to increase their prices. They had to maintain it below the average price. And even annual price increases were also uh, regulated. So uh, for the regulated molecules, they had to be in line with the uh, wholesale price index in India. So to adjust for inflation. Uh, unregulated molecules also, there was a restriction uh, that was uh, introduced where uh, price increases uh, were, uh, were to be kept to a minimum of 10% in a one-year period. So both regulated and unregulated molecules were affected by this, uh, to some extent. Uh, regulated price was set by the government and that was priced to retailer. After uh, the retailer receives a particular product, margins were fixed at 16%. 16% uh, retail margins were fixed at 16%. Right. So this was uh, how the uh, you know uh, the price uh, control order was set where the price ceiling was identified and uh, uh, all the different movements were actually controlled by the uh, TPCO 2013. Right. So all pharma firms in the country were notified in May 2013. It was kind of, it was a, you know, it was a sudden announcement and they were given time till end of June. So basically 45 days. Uh, in the mid of uh, May 2013, the order came in and within 45 days, they had to implement the price changes. And uh, this was a huge impact on the, you know, in the, on the pharmaceutical car market in the country where, uh, you know, you can see that molecules under this uh, TPCO 2013, that is 348 molecules, they constitute about 60% of the pharma market. And the government expected that you know the order would erode the market by 290 million. We don't have uh, empirical evidence for that, but that was the expectation they had when uh, the order was actually passed. Right. So, but uh, the uh, the order also included few uh, few additional uh, constraints or you know conditions per se because uh, the uh, our country has learned a lot from the prior price regulations. For instance, uh, you know uh, in the prior price regulations, one issue that was continuously that was observed was reduced supply. So whenever a price regulation was introduced, companies were exiting that category. So to avoid that, in uh, DPCO 2013, the government of India said, uh, you know, firms were allowed to exit a category, but they had to give a six months notice. And uh, NPPA, which stands for National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority, uh, which is a government law organization, so that had a right to mandate continued protection for up to 12 months. So even if a brand wanted to exit, uh, the GYI could actually restrict some, you know, put some sort of restriction on their exit uh, as well. Uh, so we went to the data and we looked at, uh, you know, how many brand exits were there. Very few brand exits were observed in our data set. Uh, so after six months, uh, because, you know, there was at least a six months of uh, mandatory notice period anyway. So the, there were a total of six brand exits, which was uh, very, which had uh, a very minimal market share. If you look at the, uh, you know, the amount of uh, molecules that were actually brought under regulation. Uh, further measures were also put in place to monitor production. So companies were actually... Uh, have, were asked to go through audits and they were also asked to self-report uh, uh, production levels and availability of regulated drugs so that supply is not affected in any way. So a lot of uh, conditions that were added to the price control order to ensure continued supply. So firms don't really shift the supply curve in any way. Right. Uh, so what we uh, argue is like, you know, economic theory, if you look at classical econ economic theory, it will predict that, you know, price caps by our regulations uh, can result in product shortages because firms may curtail supply. Right. But, uh, you know, in this case, in DPCO 2013, uh, the order ensured continued production and supply. So what we argue is because of the declining margins, uh, because of the price savings, uh, because of price savings, the margins are actually declined, firms may shift their marketing spending. So that's where they, they have some sort of control. So they can shift their marketing spending to the unregulated drugs, right? So this in turn would have a negative impact on the price regulated drugs, right? because a uh, uh, demand uh, curve is actually affected, not the demand per se, but the demand curve of the drugs are actually affected. For instance, uh, for cholesterol issues, if a, a physician may prescribe atorvastatin, which is a regulated molecule, or a rosuvastatin, which is an unregulated molecule, and firms may systematically shift their marketing efforts to the brands the, uh, of uh, rosuvastatin. So, because that's where the higher margins are. So, the price increases are controlled in the unregulated molecule. That they didn't have to really reduce the prices. So, uh, they can shift to their marketing effort to uh, unregulated molecules. So, that is that is what our primary argument is in this uh, paper. And if you look at uh, in the country, so direct to uh, consumer advertising is uh, uh, for prescription drugs is prohibited. So detailing is actually kind of the main uh, market uh, vehicle of marketing to physicians. So by detailing, we're referring to uh, the uh, medical representatives visiting the physicians and educating the physicians about their firm's products. So that's the main vehicle of marketing for the pharma companies. 
Uh, prior research has shown uh, in the marketing domain, in marketing letters and JMR, where uh, you know prescription behaviors are very very sensitive to detailing, and uh, physicians uh, you know do take uh, uh, detailing into account when they uh, prescribe certain uh, drugs to their uh, to their patients. Hence, redirecting you know redirecting these detailing efforts towards unregulated molecules should result in lowering of the uh, lower prescriptions of regulated drugs. So that's the main argument that we actually make in the paper that you know price regulation actually has resulted in companies shifting their focus to unregulated drugs and that in turn results in lower sales volume of regulated molecules so that's the entire argument we make uh, in the in the paper there's another interesting part that we can look at so that's one part of our uh, work the other part that we're looking at was uh, uh, non mbbs physicians so it's just a term that we came up with with this non mbbs where uh, we have a lot of uh, non mbbs physicians in the country uh, who have these uh, you know who are registered medical practitioners who have bams or bhms degrees and who still actively prescribe uh, uh, allopathic medicines they don't really have a formal allopathic medical degree but still prescribe so to and they have a significant standing among rural and urban slum areas in the country uh, just to give an estimate i think association of medical consultants came up with an estimate that uh, that would be at least 2.5 million in non mbbs physicians in 2017 Uh, but when uh, indian medical association did a actual survey went to the field and did a survey they could identify at least 150000 non mbbs physicians in just a few cities in andhra so that means actual number could be much much higher than 2.5 million across the country and uh, another estimate puts you know non mbbs physicians to represent about 16% of all allopathic doctors and prescriptions in the country so that's a significant uh, uh, and these uh, non mbbs physicians typically operate in rural and urban areas or typically address the Uh, health needs of the disadvantaged in the country so uh, it's kind of important that we need to uh, identify uh, or examine how this price control order has an impact on the prescription behaviors of non mbbs physicians as well so that was other objective that we had and uh, what we uh, our argument is more like you know non mbbs physicians actually uh, depend a lot more on detailing compared to your uh, G- cpgps who have mbbs degrees and that's why you know their prescription behaviors are likely to be to have been affected more Uh, when companies shift their detailing efforts so in, a, in other words non mbbs physicians uh, might end up uh, prescribing a lot more of unregulated drugs post uh, post uh, drug price control order of 2013 so this is what we actually hypothesize in the in our paper uh, so if you have any questions i can uh, take this or i can actually finish the data and analysis part and then you can discuss uh, so i'm not seeing any um, questions yeah i mean as of now it seems like there are no questions from the viewer side but i have a couple of questions do you want yeah, to take please. them now or yeah yeah please we can take them now yeah yeah so the first question is about uh, this is not directly related to the data or, i mean the you know question that you are asking in this paper but you mentioned how regulations uh, create a disincentive for innovation and there is a literature on that yeah so i was just wondering if there are examples where uh, due to a regulation in a certain stream of research a uh, company substitute and go to another stream of research so maybe they reduce doing research on one particular group of molecules and just you know shift to another group of molecules uh yeah. this is one question that we can if you want to answer it right now that's fine mechanism yeah. wise i have some more questions uh so yeah. i i'm just trying to understand the part of the price ceilings so mm-hmm. what i understand is that there is, there can be a bunch of let's say molecule let's say 10 molecules and they are priced as 1 2 3 4 till 10 so the price ceiling would be fixed at 5 it's yeah. a rather 5.5 it's average of 1 2 3 4 till 10 so then there are two uh, implications the first one is that there this price ceiling would be binding for half of the funds which were above the price ceiling yeah it would be non binding for half of the remaining funds right yeah. so it raises two questions in my mind the first one is the firms that that are you know for whom the prices are binding that is obvious that they have to now reduce the price because they have to stick yeah. to the firm. but what did the firms which were which were having non binding prices what did they do did they increase the price uh, mm-hmm. knowing that you know, i was you know selling at 3 rupees and now the government allows me to sell at 5 then i yeah. can respond to it the second follow up question on that or rather the first follow up question on that is the quantity channel uh would impact only for the firms for whom the prices are binding the the explanation that you gave where if there is a price cap then there would be a quantity shortage that is true for a homogeneous product but clearly this is not a homogeneous product because for a homogeneous product you cannot have a price dispersion 
So clearly there were brand differentiation going on and some firms would react very differentially. So the firms for whom the new price was non-binding, why would they react in terms of quantity? There is no reason for them to react. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, or maybe I am wrong. I'm just trying to understand it yeah, yeah. that how to understand it at the firm level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, differentiating between you know binding and non-binding prices based on price. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so to answer the first question, uh, so we have some evidence in uh, I think marketing science where they looked at pharmaceutical innovation, how it is affected by price regulation, and how companies, certain companies, have shifted their uh, R and D investments into you know over-the-counter uh, products and you know animal. Uh, animal food and animal stuff. So there is some evidence over there. Okay. Uh, yeah. But uh, so that was actually uh, that's uh, been there for. I think uh, we have about uh, ten years of worth of work in that particular domain in the marketing uh, uh, literature at least. Right. Uh, coming to a second and the most important question is, you know, when you have let's say ten molecules and uh, they're priced at five point five. Uh, you know, the average is about five point five. The ones above are actually re uh, required to reduce the prices to the see at least the cap. So they can go uh, uh, at five point five. But the ones below the average were not allowed to increase their prices. They were supposed to maintain their current level of prices. So I think I just uh, uh, skipped over that part. So I've actually shared the slide over here. So uh, brands already priced below, but to maintain their current prices. So they can't actually change. They can't actually go to the, uh, you know, raise it and uh, reach the ceiling part. So that was another condition that was part of the price control order. Right. So the quantity change uh, would come only from the firms who had binding effect, not the firms who were non-binding. No, but prices. everybody was actually uh, supposed to report their, uh, uh, you know, report their production and uh, because see for in some cases, uh, for instance, if you take one particular firm, let's say firm A, some of the prod, uh, some of their brands might be priced below the uh, ceiling, some of their brands might be priced above the ceiling in different categories. So that means a few brands would be they have to bring the price down other brands, other brands, they have to actually maintain the price levels, but they have to uh, report the production uh, quantity levels for uh, all their the entire at the firm level. For all their brands, so that's the uh, audit and uh, you know uh, self-report uh, part of uh, maintaining the supply. Right. Uh, okay. And uh, do you have any sense as to why there was an initial large dispersion in price? Uh, what can it be attributed to? Is it simply product differentiation, or was it was more like a brand, uh, mainly brand uh, brand differentiation? So, for instance, a okay. few of the firms positioned themselves as premium and you know high quality. Uh, brands, while others were more, uh, you know, price sensitive. We have different, uh, you know, uh, branding. Basically, it, uh, it was a branding play in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, presumably then there was a homogenization of that that factor as well after this, you know, price yeah. convergence happened. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, so now uh, I think we can shift to the uh, data part uh, where, uh, you know, uh, the data was from uh, several sources uh, from a top, one of the top five pharmaceutical firms in the country and uh, also from IMS Health India, they, uh, which is now rebranded re as IQVIA. So we had, uh, uh, we extract, we got data from several sources actually for our uh, sales as well as prescription uh, data sets. Sales data was, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, we extracted sales data for uh, 105 uh, oral solid molecules. So we extracted sales data on all the tablets and capsules. We didn't take injections and we didn't take syrups in Tokom. So we identified all the oral solid molecules, solid molecules that were part of the NLEM 2011, and we took a data, extracted data on all of them. So each molecule had multiple SKUs. For instance, it could be 10 gram, it could be uh, 5 gram, it could be 25 gram, or strength and uh, pack size and strength combination. So we took SKUs for all these 105. So that resulted in 179 SKUs. So we could do our analysis at uh, SKU level where we had un data on 179 SKUs and we had data over fi five years, May 2009 to June 2014. So pre-regulation period would be May 2009 to June 2013 and post-regulation would be July to June 2014. And uh, we also made sure that there were no, uh, check the data to ensure that there were no major brand exits uh, which had significant market share. So there were no brand exits in the one year period because the post-regulation period that we're actually assessing is one year right after DPCO. And uh, of course, there were no price increases for 12 months for unregulated molecules. That is another reason why we took the one year window to uh, do our analysis. Right. And we also had a lot of molecule level properties, for instance, whether the molecule is typically prescribed for acute or chronic issues, whether it's for a primary indication, what is the primary indication for which uh, it's being prescribed, uh, whether it's co prescribed or not, and percentage prescriptions by CPGP. For instance, uh, you know, for a cancer drug, uh, 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 then the CPGP might uh, actually prescribe, number of CPGPs who prescribe that would be very, very less, whereas uh, uh, 
you know uh, an antibiotic would be majority be uh, prescribed by cpgp so we had data on that as well and we had some data on uh, city wise uh, uh, where you know uh, indian cities were categorized into four groups metro class 1 class 2 to 4 and rural we combined class 2 to 4 and rural and we had a percentage of uh, uh, sales from that particular uh, uh, segment as also so we had some sort of molecule level properties as well right uh, we also had non mbbs prescription percentage uh, but prescriptions are typically at the molecule level they are not at the sku level because um, data set that we uh, used was you know were more uh, prescriptions at the molecule level and data was available on 51 of the 105 regulated molecules and uh, we ensured that uh, we checked the total value and we found that the 51 molecules on which we have data they co constitute about 90% of the total value total market value uh, for the prescriptions also we had 5 years of data may 2009 to 2014 though we had much more granular data from 2012 onwards right uh, so this is just to illustrate you know uh, combining all the 179 stus because you know we have too many uh, molecules we just combine all of them just to give an indication of you know uh, how the trend looked like so there was a huge increase in trend uh, prior to dpc1 kind of slowed down to some extent uh, in certain categories we looked at the we'll break it down as we go along so this is the overall prescriptive trend of uh, the data before and after regulation and in non mbbx orx percentage you know you can see a clear drop right you know after you know, the dpc with as a huge decline around dpc also so uh, this is for the 51 molecules combined together the average for the 51 molecules right anyway now moving on to the empirical strategy part uh so though uh, the uh, intervention is kind of like you know sudden and uh, it could be considered random but an ideal experiment would be you select a random set of molecules the molecules themselves are random you regulate the prices and compare them against another randomly set of unregulated molecules but it's not a random uh, selection of molecules because you know all these molecules were considered to be life saving so that's why they're part of the national list of essential uh, medicines uh, so the decision to include a molecule in nlem or tpc was actually quite uh, it's not random there's a systematic uh, element to it right and uh, identifying a credible control group for this uh, set of uh, regulated molecules is a huge challenge uh, you can uh, ideally you should be selecting very similar molecules that are unregulated but are completely unaffected by the regulation but what we find uh, even our argument is that you know when a particular molecule is regulated the closely related or you know are uh, closely associated other molecules that are not regulated are also going to be affected because the sales of those unregulated are going to increase sales of regulated are going to decrease that's basically our argument so the unregulated can't really act as a credible counterfactual for the uh, regulated molecules credible counter counterfactual control for the uh, you know uh, regulated molecules so that was a huge challenge we had and we can't even go to a different categories and pick up you know Uh, over the counter medicines because they are systematically different uh, we can't pick up uh, completely unrelated therapeutic classes so uh, in a way creating a control group credible counterfactual was a huge issue so we can't really do a, a difference and difference kind of an approach so that's why we adopted a you know within series approach where we looked at uh, the time series within uh, each of these molecules so we adopted a regression discontinuity in time approach where you know uh, the there is a particular trend to the molecule sales volume and there is a uh, we check whether a discontinuity is introduced because of this uh, you know drug price control order so the time of implementation acts as a cut off so uh, in the sense you know just after the intervention came into play uh, was there a change in the regression uh, continuity so that's basically what we're testing just to give an el uh, illustration of uh, in a simple manner for a linear uh, uh, regression discontinuity so you can see that prior to the cut off cut off which is 50 Prior to the cutoff, there is a particular trend, and you know there is a particular line. And post cutoff, there is uh, uh, there is a significant shift, uh, and the uh, you know regression line is kind of discontinuous. So that difference or the shift is what we call as a local treat average treatment effect (LAT) late estimates. Right. So we kind of you know uh, our objective was to use this particular methodology, apply this to every single SKU, look at their sales volume, and identify whether uh, around the point of uh, intervention around dpc 2013 is there a shift in the uh, uh, regression uh, line so this would be the case if there is no effect uh, due to uh, the cut off score so if there is no effect then you should be adding, uh, typically be observing a uh, simple line of uh, this sort right uh, so observations uh, so the intuition is very simple for regression discontinuity in time uh, observation just before and just after right uh, after the regulation are expected to be very similar uh, because you know it's just close to the cut off they should be very similar for instance uh, the idea is uh, you know if uh, you say 1500 dollars is the cut off uh, below which you will identify a particular household as below poverty above which you will identify as uh, not below poverty right so just around 1500 for instance a household might have 1450 dollars as income and another household might have 1550 dollars as income 
that you know not, need not be any difference between these two houses and not a huge difference between these two houses but just because of the cutoff they belong to two different categories so they are typically comparable in a way that's the basic idea behind uh, rdit as well where just before the uh, uh, dpc1 after the dpc1 the observations are expected to be similar of course after accounting for time trends and the bandwidth within which they are supposed to be similar we identify using a data driven approach which is up, uh, which is proposed by imbens kalyana raman so we uh, it's called imbens kalyana raman bandwidth actually so we calculate the bandwidth and we within that bandwidth the observations are expected to be similar and then we uh, identify uh, whether there is a uh, discontinuity in the regression and uh, the interesting thing is you know regression discontinuity has very high internal validity so we can uh, aspect causality but uh, results cannot be generalized to other sub populations of molecules it's very specific to each molecule the latv uh, local average treatment effects are specific to that particular molecular sku for which we are actually capturing that effect right so this is an example of rdit in our study for a, a simple example where there is a, a second order polynomial time trend and you have uh, you can clearly see a discontinuity uh, between the fitted regression lines between the Uh, you know, before the regulation and after the regulation. So the estimate would be called LAT. This is just for one of the SKUs, uh, just for illustration. So we did that for each of those 179 SKUs, identified the bandwidth for each one of those uh, SKUs, and uh, calculated the local average treatment effect. Uh, and we could actually, you know, kind of get a sense of what is the impact of uh, uh, DPC1 on the whole gamut of 179 SKUs that we have in our data set. So we could also identify a lot of other uh, prior work, uh, recent research work that has actually used RDIT as a main identification strategy. Uh, for instance, in AER, in marketing science, and JPE, JMR. Uh, although they used it on a very small scale, where it's either you know one company and one event kind of a uh, kind of a calculation. We are doing that across 179 to show systematically that you know there is some sort of a discontinuity across several SKU. Right. So uh, the one of the uh, key, like key aspects of uh, regression discontinuity, as I mentioned, is you know it's, it has high internal validity, uh, but identifies very close to the uh, the parcel effect is identified very close to the policy implementation period, so just before and after. But however, long term effects are not captured. So to get some idea about the long term effect, though it's uh, you know suggestive evidence, it's not actually causal evidence. We adopted a forecast method, so where we used the pre-regulation data, four years of pre-regulation sales. to identify the best fitting sarima model and uh, use that particular uh, function to forecast sales volumes uh, in the post regulation period and use that as counterfactuals so we could actually forecast for 12 months test for significance and then you know compare with the actual sales volume again test for direction and significance now what we uh, hypothesize we expect was you know the results to be consistent with rdit design in terms of uh, direction and significance so that will tell us something about you know in long term whether these effects that we identified they are actually uh, in the long term in the sense for the 12 months uh, whether the uh, effect sustained right so these were a summary of our results so just I mean, we had a lot of results but to just you know summarize and put them in a simple form uh, overall uh, the lat estimates if we take an average of all the significant lat estimates uh, majority of them had negative so 61 out of 70 skus had actually negative lat so that means there was a decline in sales volume for 61 skus and the average is about uh, 3 and a half million and we also did an effect size because each lat is actually specific to a particular uh, mole molecular sku uh, we did an F, uh, we did a meta analysis combined all their effect sizes and we found the effect sizes to be uh, negative and significant as well uh, and our sarima forecast so where we forecast for the next 12 months and compare it to actuals even that the average treatment effects was found to be negative and uh, almost there was a uh, there was some sort of consistent effect what we identified in uh, uh, rdat as well as in sarima for in long term forecast Coming to uh, non-MBBS uh, uh, prescription percentage, uh, again the prescription percentage declined for about 18 of the 50. I mean, 18 had significant uh, uh, LATs, and out of which 14 were negative LATs. Right. So that was a, and overall average was also negative. And uh, even the Sarima forecast actually showed that you know there was a negative effect of uh, on non-MBBS prescription percentage for uh, the same uh, 14 out of the 18 molecules. So that's the you know, overall summary of the results. Uh, we did a lot of robustness uh, test for rdit design so following the guidelines given by hosman and rapson in 2018 the guidelines were developed specifically for rdit designs uh, some of them were like you know doing a lot of placebo tests like we did a placebo test around the announcement of nlem to make sure that you know announcement of nlem didn't really have an impact on uh, sales volumes and announcement of possible price control there was an article in one of the newspapers it was not publicized but even then we took that particular article as uh, you know potential announcement of price control and we did a placebo test to show that there was not really a change in sales volumes we also did a lot of uh, you know uh, we dropped may and june because implementation period was uh, may and june we dropped those two months and we did a uh, again we are accounted for time trends and we did again 
uh, regression test and okay, found the results to be uh, results to be consistent. Even for the Sarima forecast, forecast method, we did a lot of uh, robustness tests where we showed that the forecasts were really working well when there was no regulation, and uh, we used different uh, uh, different uh, types of uh, placebo tests even for the Sarima, uh, Sarima forecast. We also went with different specifications for outcome variables. One of the reviewers actually suggested looking at uh, you know percentage changes in sales volumes by using log of sales volume. Then we also multiplied this uh, prescription percentage of non-MBBS with the sales volume to get an indication of number of volume of uh, sales to these uh, uh, you know rural and uh, disadvantaged uh, uh, area people, and we could actually find that uh, the results were consistent with what we found. So it was just a product of these two. Uh, Finally, uh, the uh, final part of our main analysis was, you know, we did have data on unregulated molecules, so we wanted to compare how, wanted to see how the unregulated molecules themselves were affected. So we had data on uh, 50, uh, I mean, uh, we took 51 molecules, we didn't take it at the SKU level, uh, we had uh, data only at the molecule level for the unregulated molecules, so we took regulated also 51 molecules we took uh, as regulated and we identified a particular counterpart as an unregulated molecule, which is not under regulation. So, for instance, uh, for atrovastatin, we identified rosuvastatin as a uh, counter counterfactual. For uh, omeprazole, we had uh, two or three that could be uh, used as substitutes. So, rabiprazole and pantoprazole were identified as uh, the counterparts for uh, omeprazole. So, that way, we came up with you know 57 unregulated molecules, which are closely related to the regulated ones, and uh, we could do some sort of analysis and see what has happened to these 57 unregulated molecules. Uh, so what we did, uh, used this uh, data on 57 unregulated molecules is first we did uh, again RD80 and Sarima for these unregulated molecules to see if there was an increase. Because regulated molecules has a decrease in sales volume, so we wanted to see if there is a corresponding increase in sales volume for the unregulated molecules. We could also do a definitive estimate and we also did propensity score matching to match the you know regulated and unregulated molecules and again calculate a definitive. Finally, we also tested the selection criteria. Was there any systematic bias in uh, selecting between Atruva and Rasuva, for instance? So what drove the selection uh, into NLEM? So that is, uh, these are the four different analysis that we did. Uh, as expected, uh, I won't go through the results in detail, but uh, overall, the sales volume did increase for the unregulated molecules, for majority of the unregulated molecules, and uh, uh, non-MBBS uh, prescriptions are also went up for these uh, unregulated molecules. So we could find support for both. Uh, that regulated molecule sales is going down, unregulated molecule sales is going up. When we did a, a definitive estimate, so you can see the interaction between uh, the post-regulation period as whether and whether the uh, molecule is under NLEM or not, they're actually negative. So uh, indicating that, you know, the, those molecules that are under regulation went through actually a drop in uh, sales volume as well as drop in non mbbs prescriptions. So we added, a, we did a lot of uh, uh, robustness checks by adding polynomial time trends of different uh, orders and we, we had consistent results over here. So finally, we also matched on several parameters like, you know, whether it's an acute or chronic, whether uh, the overall sales volume, so some sort of parallel trends, we matched those. And we could also identify that the pattern of results remained the same. That is the sales volume of uh, regulated molecules came down and the non mbbs prescriptions of regulated molecules came down. So this is what we had in terms of uh, regulated versus unregulated. Final part of it was, you know, uh, trying to identify uh, what drove the selection of the regulated molecules, and we uh, built a profit model to look at, you know, uh, whether any of these factors had a significant impact on selection into NLEM. We found that non-MBBS Rx percentage actually had a significant impact on being selected, a molecule being selected into uh, as being an NLEM. So that clearly indicates that, you know, our results are conservative. For instance, those that are already important to rural and disadvantaged areas, those were the ones brought under regulation. And after regulation, those actually declined. So that means our results are actually much more conservative than the actual effects that we observe in them. So there was no bias that we could identify into the selection of uh, regulated molecules. Right. So that's the overall findings. So overall findings, we had support for our hypothesis. But uh, we want a mechanism. Uh, we had to provide some sort of uh, empirical evidence for the mechanism that we were claiming. Uh, there are several explanations for our findings. Uh, for instance, uh, maybe the demand for the drugs uh, changed after the regulation, but uh, uh, you know it's uh, not uh, it's not possible for the demand to be dependent on uh, dependent on the regulation. For instance, number of heart diseases or cardiac issues in the country may not be affected by the regulation. So that we can rule out. Change in supply could definitely be an uh, have an impact, but uh, because of the restrictions uh, placed by the uh, placed by the DPCO, there's no uh, there's not a huge change in supply. There are no brand exits. There is no, you know, a company stopping production. So change in supply cannot actually, uh, you know, uh, explain our findings. Uh, the other argument one of the reviewers pointed out was maybe unregulated molecules dropped their prices. So if they dropped their prices, their uh, 
you know demand could have gone up and their uh, sales could have gone up but we went to and took the price of unregulated molecules we showed that the price of unregulated molecules didn't really change uh, in the post regulation period one of the reasons was Uh, unregulated molecules were allowed to raise on by increase their prices only by 10% in any one year period so if they lower their prices it's going to have a permanent impact on what prices they can charge so none of the companies actually reduce the prices of unregulated molecules uh, the final two and the most significant ones we could identify were the retailers could have stopped stocking right because the retailer margins have been fixed at 16% so that could be one of the reasons uh, but what we found was uh, you know uh, we had some anecdotal evidence that retailers were actually Uh, revolting against the companies and saying that you know uh, they are not going to stock their products because the margins are lower. Uh, there was one report which said that 65% of the pharma firms restored the older trade margins and took on the losses. So they actually took on the losses just to make sure that the retailers stock their products. Uh, but the other interesting thing is if a physician literally prescribes a particular molecule and the molecule is not being stocked by the retailer, retailer would lose out to the uh, competitor. So we argue that you know. stocking behavior may not be the potential explanation at the country level for uh, the sales volumes of the drugs to actually go down finally uh, that leaves us with one possible explanation which is detailing so when like i mentioned so when profit margins decline companies may react by shifting their detailing efforts to more profitable brands so we went to a one particular top 5 pharma pharma firms in the country uh, we extracted detailing data for 27 regulated brands and 27 unregulated brands the quantum facts right uh, so we had data we had a lot of granular data but i won't take you through the granular data but overall we had data on their uh, data on the number of visits in terms of detailing visits to the doctors and we had um, 15 months of pre regulation data and 12 months of post regulation data we again did an regression discontinuity for each of these 27 regulated and 27 unregulated brands and what we found was you know for the regulated brands uh, there was a regression discontinuity and there was a drop in uh, drop in uh, overall detailing right and sales volume also dropped for those brands But for the unregulated ones, like you see in the bottom of the panel, uh, the detailing efforts actually shot up significantly, and the sales volume also shot up significantly. So we could actually find that the uh, change in sales volume was primarily driven by change in detailing. Though we could provide evidence only from one firm, so this kind of you know suggestive evidence that the mechanism that we propose is actually there's some empirical evidence for the mechanism that we propose. Uh, so this is a sample of results for uh, what we have in uh, for when we did the analysis on. uh in the, uh, the detailing efforts by by that particular company so you can see that in the uh, top half when uh, uh, for the regulated brand you know there is a drop in uh, uh, there is a drop in uh, you know non core and core visits whereas for the unregulated one there is a clearly an increase in the uh, increase in uh, detailing efforts so we had some sort of evidence for uh, you know detailing being the driving force behind the sales volume getting reduced for the regulated ones right and uh, so we also uh, at the second part of the mechanism was you know uh, we are claiming that non mbbs uh, uh, doctors pres- uh, uh, have dropped their uh, you know uh, prescriptions of regulated ones because they rely a lot more on uh, detailing so prior research only shows that you know almost all physicians depend on detailing to some extent to prescribe but what we were claiming was non mbbs was actually depending a little bit more the effect is much more accentuated for non mbbs physicians so we did not have any empirical evidence so we did a pr- primary research work in that domain uh, we created an application uh, in android uh, it was combined effort uh, from researchers 12 interns and market research agency uh, across few cities in the country we developed a questionnaire for two particular antibiotics amoxicillin clavulanic acid which was regulated and cefcodoxin which was unregulated at that point in time so these are comparable molecules so we wanted to capture the prescription behaviors for both these uh, both these molecules and also you know what is the medical rep visits in the last 30 days how many times did the medical rep visit visited them and what is the duration of each of these visits from the pharma companies so we uh, developed an elaborate questionnaire on the, along that line and we had data from 772 physicians so so we had to balance the data and so we had to you know uh, extend and find a lot identify a lot of non mbbs so we had 398 and 374 from the uh, two groups and uh, uh each physician responded for multiple brands so amoxicillin clavulanic is one molecule but there are two, uh, almost 200 brands in the country right 200 sku's in the country so uh, any single doctor would be prescribing three or four brands uh, that prescription behavior is driven by a lot of factors so we identified all of those so we had a lot of data points from uh, uh, these 772 physicians and we developed a model where we could identify whether the medical rep visits or the detailing effort uh, had a higher impact for the non mbbs physicians So you can see from the highlighted one, the interaction that is uh, for non-MBBS doctors, the effect of law, uh, medical visits or detailing is actually much higher. It's positive for uh, the prescription percentage for a particular brand. 
we had some significant uh, uh, significant and consistent results over there after controlling for physician uh, fixed effects and molecule fixed effects brand level fixed effects we had consistent results throughout uh, so this we could actually provide some sort of uh, evidence for the non mbbs uh, some sort of uh, empirical evidence for the non mbbs part right finally coming to the conclusion just to summarize because we had a whole host of results just to summarize post tpco sales volumes of regu uh, regulated drugs declined sales volumes of unregulated drugs which are actually close substitutes of the regulated ones those uh, drugs increased the mechanism was firms may have shifted their marketing spending to detailing to unregulated drugs in the same class that by lowering the demand uh, or shifting the demand curve for the regulated molecules so we find a similar pattern for in non mbbs physicians non mbbs physicians uh, reduce their uh, you know percentage prescriptions for uh, regulated molecules and increased their prescriptions on unregulated molecules the mechanism is they are relying a lot more on detailing since companies have reduced the detailing efforts to uh, overall for these regulated ones non mbbs physicians uh, were affected a lot more so that's the overall uh, set of results implications are very straightforward uh, you know uh, we argued that you know you need to bring a few categories identify few fo focus on few categories and extend the price ceiling to all molecules in that category so uh, shifting of uh, detailing efforts wouldn't really have any sort of uh, you know up, up provide any sort of advantage differentially to different firms there's a lot of heterogeneity there but um, we didn't actually get into that we looked at the national level uh, overall effect of regulation so we also identified four drug categories for instance hypertension antibiotics ppis and cholesterol and we could show that if we combine regulated and unregulated overall there is a huge uh, uh, you know there's a negative impact so overall the categories themselves were affected and there was a huge uh, decline in uh, sales volumes of the drugs in those categories right Uh, further steps, like I mentioned, so the key uh, uh, issue that we faced was identifying a clear uh, control group uh, because you know we can't use the over-the-counter medicines and because they are completely unrelated to the uh, you know uh, essential medicines, uh, we can't go outside the categories of essential medicines. Then they are not really comparable. So what we proposed was you know we can actually compare the uh, compare it to another country. So we shortlisted three countries: Philippines, Indonesia, and Turkey. after a lot of thought into it so we actually finally split philippines uh, there was a price regulation in philippines in 2008 but it was limited to five molecules so the market was still you know uh, some sort of free market for a long time and few more policies were introduced in the in our analysis period so we have to account for that in our analysis so basically what we'll be doing is uh, if we take a particular molecule in india we'll take the corresponding molecule in philippines uh, make sure that they have parallel trends uh, in the pre regulation period and compare the sales between the two countries in the post uh, dpco so that will give some sort of a different estimate and we could actually create a credible counterfactual using that uh, some sort of a synthetic controls or something using philippines as a main country so that's what we have in mind so this we have not yet completed uh, we've just uh, in the process of acquiring the data for on uh, philippines uh, so few acknowledgements so this uh, the especially the philippines data has been funded by the uh, stigler center research grant from wood school of business Uh, we've also had for the primary research with the physicians on the ground uh, we had category 1 research funding from iim kolkata we also had research funding from iim ahmedabad to conduct the primary research work right so that's basically the uh, details of uh, what we've done in terms of uh, assessing the drug price control order in india any questions i'll be glad to take it up thank you so much yeah. Yeah, so first of all that was a great talk and uh, huge set of analysis it's very impressive uh, very nice Uh, I had a question. Um, uh, so one, I guess I will have to take it offline. I don't know. So you talked something about donut something. Yeah. But I didn't get. Uh, what is that? Uh, so donut is actually. So you have a regression discontinuity. There is a cut. You know, till June. Uh, till June 2013, you have continuous data. And right. at July, you are trying to identify whether there is a shift in the regression line and there is a discontinuity. In a donut, what we do is we drop two or three months pre, two or three months post. and then identify you know and control for the time uh, you know uh, time uh, time trend factor and then identify after dropping that you know there's a whole kind of a thing three three months is drop and after dropping the donut you know is that still a regression discontinuity and is that a, yeah that is a donut are you taking yeah okay so my second question is uh, you know farms would be differentially impacted by or molecules would be differentially impacted by this regulation yeah uh, do you see a differential response within the treated group of molecules in the sense that for the molecule for which the price drop would be significantly larger yeah. than for which the molecule the effect is not that large do you yeah. see the quantitative response so, so essentially it's a question of what is the elasticity and if you see any major difference yeah yeah 
So I've not actually added that slide in the in this, but what we did was we took the LAT estimates of each of those molecules and we actually regressed it on, you know, what was the average price reduction in the particular market. We also had average, uh, you know, uh, you know, what, what was the CPGP percentage to, uh, you know, identify whether there is, uh, the LAT is dependent on any of those factors. So we did find that price reduction actually, the amount of price reduction actually had a significant impact on our LAT estimates. For instance, if a particular molecule, the price reduction, the entire market that suffered was about, you know, uh, 20 percent then uh, compared to another molecule which suffered only five percent then there was a huge difference in uh, LAT estimate so you're exactly right over there so price reduction did have a huge impact okay, so, okay. Right. so now i guess we, i will make it open uh, to the floor uh, you may want to check the chat box there is a bunch of questions from ankit shah and you may want to take them and then uh, rahul deo jada is uh, requesting the PPT in case you decide yeah. to circulate it. Yeah. Uh, to answer uh, uh, Mr. Ankitsha's question, so how are the molecules classified? Uh, so uh, uh, the Department of Pharmaceuticals actually had a national consultation meet. So uh, it was not on any quantitative criteria. Uh, they did take sales into account, but uh, they had different expert groups. So they had people from pharma, they had people from uh, uh, you know, uh, different uh, uh, fields of practice and special uh, special specialties. And uh, they were all, uh, you know, it was a four day process where they had separated into different divisions and they went through a lot of discussion to identify the criteria. So I'll just put up the slide related to, uh, yeah. Yeah, so this is the one. So national consultation meet which was attended by experts from multiple agencies. They formulated the criteria so it was more like you know what are the drugs that are very very essential and can we uh, identify them and we can we prepare a list because world health organization had an essential list but uh, we didn't want to actually adopt that list directly because the uh, uh, prevalence of disease prevalence and medicine costs are most mostly country specific and uh, the uh, rosewood statins are bracketed under the same therapeutic class but only atherosclerosis statin was brought under regulation uh, because of uh, the national consultation need, they decided that, you know, it's sufficient to bring Atova statin under regulation and not uh, Rosova statin. But subsequently, later on in 2015, they did bring in a lot more uh, uh, drugs in, under regulation. But in 2013, when they introduced uh, the drug price control order of 2013, only Atova statin was under the regulated category. They didn't regulate uh, Rosova statin. It, uh, it went into unregulated category. Right. Uh, so... Price elasticity, I'm not really aware of any papers that I could actually looked at the price elasticity of demand. Uh, but yeah, uh, you, yeah as for uh, affordability of patients, uh, there, is, there are, I think, one or two papers, but they looked at one or two molecules. So uh, they've not looked at, you know, this uh, amount of SPUs that we have actually looked at. It's quite, it covers the entire country and we looked at all the molecules that were under regulation. There are some papers that have actually looked at, you know, uh, uh, affordability of patients uh, where uh, some sort of uh, different types of price control mechanisms were introduced. So one of the papers in Europe actually that I have in the slides. But uh, apart from that, I think, uh, you know, there's not a, a lot of uh, empirical work on, uh, you know, looking at a country level data and uh, about one, all the SKUs that were affected by uh, price uh, price regulation and how the price elasticity was affected. No, not, really, not to my knowledge, as far as I know. No. Right. And uh, yeah, so I think uh, the four point will anyways be entire in the YouTube uh, stream, but I can share the PowerPoint uh, anyway, right? Uh, if there's any other questions, so we would love to take uh, more questions. There is still some time left. Ayushman Bharat Yojana. So, uh, no, I'm not. I don't think. Uh, that would really have an impact on drug prices, at least price control. They're not going to have an impact on price control, but definitely those will have an impact on sales volumes, right? So if the, uh, because of Bharat Yojana, they're under, a, I think, a lot of subsidy and they're being uh, given to, uh, this, this is a very interesting because we had a parallel thing in Philippines as well. So they call it GMAP and they call it, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, they have a technical term for it, Patolo or something. So where they kept up subsidy stores, I think this model was from there. So the Aishman Bharat Yojana. So they'll definitely have an impact on sales volumes. But uh, I think regulation-wise, I think it's more for uh, you know uh, prescription medicine that are sold uh, over ph pharmacies by retailers. Total molecules in uh, uh, in DPCO 2013 were 348 formulations. Out of which 105 were oral solid molecules. We took all the 105 and uh, we took uh, multiple SKUs. And that is, you know, for instance, atherosclerosis may come in 5 milligram, 10 milligram, 25 milligram. We took up all of them. So we had 179 SKUs. 
uh, all oral solid molecules that were covered under DPCO 2013. And uh, the sample size was, you know, uh, we had uh, 179 SKUs and uh, we had data for five years, that's 62 months of sales volume for each of these 179 SKUs. That's the sample that we have, that we used in analysis. Yeah, so the only way to avoid the exit of companies is, you know, uh, when you come, uh, is to mandate continued production. There is no other, like what they did in DPCO 2013. And for instance, if a flagship product for a company is like, let's say, Atharva Statin, right? They are Omiprazole for that matter. They can't actually uh, uh, shift out of that particular uh, company. So you can't, uh, and you can also mandate production. So that's one of the, uh, that could be one of the, you know, uh, uh, one of the conditions that's included in the kind of price control order that, you know, um, uh, production is mandated and uh, like audits and self reports are actually mandatory. That is the only way to actually bring the entire market under regulation, entire category under regulation. For that matter. Yeah. There is a request for sending a feedback link. I'm not exactly sure what would be a feedback link here. Uh, Dr. K. Balaji. Could you please care to elaborate on what is feedback link? And others, please, you know, you can ask questions for the next few minutes. Or otherwise, we will close to you. We will close the session. No, no, no. We, uh, uh, I was actually presenting that for, uh, you know, uh, in developing nations, how price control has had an impact on uh, R&D and innovation. So uh, that was actually prior literature on, uh, so this is actually on developed nations and uh, how uh, the prior research work has actually looked at uh, uh, delay of uh, drug launches. These are not in India, actually. So these are from uh, developed nations and uh, how R&D investments are affected, how pharmacy, not in India, yeah. Okay, all right. So I guess uh, it was a very exciting session, very uh, important results, and I guess it's an ongoing work. So uh, I hope it is of some use to you as well, Saravana. Uh, okay, all right. So this is this might be the last question that you may want, uh, want to take. Uh, exports business DPCO did have an impact on exports as well. Uh, one of the interesting uh, things we noticed, uh, although we don't have empirical work, is you know some of the executives that we work with at time Calcutta uh, from a, you know I don't want to name the pharmaceuticals. They were like uh, who had a lot of export business. Uh, they were actually saying that you know uh, the prices in the local country has decreased a lot, and they were expecting similar kind of some sort of a reference price effect was there. They wanted their prices to be decreased to a great extent, at least with one major uh, drug uh, drug manufacturer in the country. So they did have an impact on uh, the price levels that were expected by uh, people, at least in the MENA region. So there was some sort of an impact because of DPCO. We don't have empirical evidence on that, but there is some sort of anecdotal evidence that they did affect export business in terms of uh, the other companies in the Gulf region, MENA region, actually uh, you know, requesting some sort of a reduction in the prices that they are being charged, because there's a huge discrepancy between the two. Uh, okay, so thank you all, and uh, I'm not sure if we provide an e-certificate, but this can be taken up by our office, I suppose. E-certificate for what, Anandya? I do not know. There is a query on providing e-certificate. I am not sure. I think we should provide. make it clear that these research, research seminars are simply for attending and gaining information. There's no certificate of attendance or anything over here. Yeah, I, <laughs> I guess that is a you know, perfect answer to it. All right, cool. So let us uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Saravana Jai Kumar. It has been a pleasure you know, having you here. And uh, so I hope everyone had some you know, useful takeaways from this. So thank you all for attending. And we would love to see you in the next session, which CMHS again will organize and appropriately advertise on media. Thank you very much. And thank you, Saravana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pan India, for hosting this. And thanks for the opportunity to present my research work in this forum. Yeah, thank you so much.